Welcome to Justice Matters. I'm San Francisco Public Defender Jeff Adachi. It's been said that there are two justice systems, one for the rich and famous and the other for the rest of us. At the heart of that contention is the bail system. Oscar Pistorius was granted bail while he awaited trial for the murder of his girlfriend. Bernie Madoff was allowed to stay out of jail under house arrest in his penthouse on the condition that he paid for 24-hour private security guards. Ross Limbaugh, accused of illegally obtaining 2,000 painkillers from four doctors over a six-month period, was released on $3,000 bail an hour after he turned himself in. When actor Charlie Sheen was arrested for felony domestic violence, he bailed out the same day by posting an $8,500 bond. Most people in jail simply can't afford to buy their freedom. And more than three quarters of jail inmates haven't even been convicted of a crime. Why do some people stay locked up while others go free? Is it because of the risk to the public, their danger of running away, or is it merely the amount of money that they have? But what if you can't afford bail in the first place? You sit in jail and you call this guy. You can be accused of anything in our society. You have to have the the money to get out to defend yourself. For the wealthy person, he can be bailed out right away. He has a financial wherewithal to get out. And if you don't have the money, you will come to us. What's wrong, baby? I'm in trouble with the law. Don't you worry about a thing. Mama's gonna call bad boys bail bonds. They'll know what to do. When we bail you out, we're providing you a service and we wanna get paid on it. Cause your mama wants you home. I'm here to take care of some business for my brother who is incarcerated here in LA County. His bail is $400,000. We put that up to the court. We charge 10%. That is non-refundable. That's our fee. Even at 10% of that, that's $40,000. Who has that laying around? In the end, Lamont would have to pay 40 grand while these guys get their money back paying nothing. It's increasing the number of people staying in jail prior to their court date because they can't afford to hire a commercial well bondsman. We like the system the way it is now. That's what keeps us in business. The bail bondsmen are the people you see on the street, but behind the scenes, the industry is making sure that bail profiteering is here to stay. They formed a powerful lobbying group called the American Bail Coalition to make sure that the profits keep rolling in. They've been successful in several states in passing legislation that is pro-commercial bail. And it has done so with ALEC, a group that pushes pro-corporate models of legislation. In 2011, they drafted 12 model bills fortifying the commercial bail industry, and through ALEC, we're able to promote those bills to uh, state governors and legislators. I'm not so crazy as not to know that you've already figured out that if I can talk you into doing this bill, my clients are going to make some money on the bond premiums. Since ABC was founded, bail amounts have skyrocketed. The rest of the world is a little puzzled as to why we use it, um, particularly because of the, the impacts on people's rights and freedom. Only two countries in the world use commercial bail, just two. We don't want no regulations, keep the laws the same, don't want anything changed basically, and that's just the truth. We don't want no changes in the bail industry. We provide a service, and we want to get paid for those services. With us today on Justice Matters are Kryn Rankin, a bail agent and former president of the San Mateo County Bail Association. Dan McAleer, the director of the Center on Juvenile and Criminal Justice. And Sonia Tafoya, a researcher with the Public Policy Institute of California. Welcome to Justice Matters. Thank you, Thank you Jeff. You. Now I'm gonna start with you, Corinne. Okay. Uh, tell us, how does bail work? Well, first of all, bail is insurance. So I, I'm an insurance agent and uh, I sell appearance bonds, otherwise commonly known as bail bonds. Uh, how bail works is and when you or your family member, you have a loved one that's arrested, uh, you have two options. You can put up the entire bail amount with the court. So let's say you have a bail of $10,000. So you would take the $10,000 and you'd put it up with the court. And the court would then uh, secure the, the defendant's release from custody and the, the, the money would be their financial guarantee that the defendant would make each and every court appearance. Uh, 
Uh, most people don't have ten thousand dollars that they can do that, so they opt for the the much more affordable option, which is obtaining a bail bond. So they go into their local bail bond agency and. Uh, and pay a policy premium, which is a, a small percentage of the actual bail amount, and they get a policy that guarantees uh, their loved one's appearance uh, to every single one of their court, appearance, court dates. Now, Karen, do you think that the bail system is broken, or is it fine the way it is? Well, as with anything, uh, the bail system can certainly benefit from a few impu improvements here or there, here and there, um, just as, as time goes on. Uh, however, th the bail system is the only form of pretrial release that guarantees a person's appearance at every single court date. So we make that promise to the court, and it's a guarantee, and, and we deliver on that guarantee. Uh, the Department of Justice uh, released a study a while back, and it was, it was um, regarding pretrial services. So they, they studied the various forms of pretrial release and they determined that bail was in fact the most effective form of pretrial release. And the bail, the bail industry as a whole has about a 3% failure rate. So our, the bail system and the way the commercial bail system works is nearly perfect uh, with a 3% failure rate. So I don't think that uh, it would be wise to reform a system that is operating at such a high success rate. Okay. Now, Dan, we live in a capitalist society, and so we exchange everything, services for money. And what Corinne's saying is that she will guarantee performance 97% of the time that the person shows up. What do you think? Well, a couple, a couple things. One, I think when you ask most people how they want the justice system to function. They want the justice system to be fair and they want the justice system to be equitable. We have about 70% 70, 70 of the people that right now in the state of California who are sitting in jail have not been convicted of a crime. Many of them are sitting in jail not because they can't be released or because they present an excessive risk to society. They're sitting there because they can't make bail, because every county in the state of California sets bail rates at different, at, at different, at, at different rates. And so, um, so it's not based upon whether or not, you know, you're a high risk or it's not based upon so much on even the crime you commit. Very often it's based on your geographical location, which county you happen to end up in. I think what most people want is an effective criminal justice system. And part of an effective criminal justice system is coming up with a system of pretrial release where we make a decision whether or not somebody is held in jail or whether they are to be released back in the public based upon their risk. Some system of rational decision making, and I'm sorry, the bail system is not a rational decision making. The bail system today is based upon whether or not somebody can pay to have themselves released from jail. Few, few, I agree, few people can actually pay the total amount of any bail, but if they pay, but, but they pay a certain percentage but they still have to be able to do that. So that's, that's a system that's based on your ability to pay, not on whether or not you are a risk to the public, which is really what the decision should be based on. Now, uh, Sonia, you did a, a study on bail and, and the need for bail reform. And one of the things that you found is that, you know, bails are going up. And in San Francisco, for example, contempt of court, uh, just in the last year, has gone up a uh, hundred percent from ten thousand dollars to twenty thousand dollars. Why is that so? Why are these bails uh, going up year by year? Um, well, Jeff, uh, California statute places the responsibility for setting bail uh, with the superior court judges of each county. So uh, for each county, the judges deliberate annually and they come up with a bail schedule that generally is posted online. Um, and it has the bail amounts for by offense. And typically, uh, the most severe offenses have the highest bail amounts, and those that are considered less severe have lower bail amounts. Um, but uh, the bail schedule doesn't come with an explanation of the deliberations that the, the local judges went through to arrive at those numbers. So I guess to really know why San Francisco's bail uh, for that particular offense went up that much, 
you would have to consult with the Superior Court judges of San Francisco. So these determinations are all made uh, just by the judges in, in a private meeting. And the result is, is that we have uh, 58 counties who have different bails. And uh, just to give you some examples here, uh, for sales of a controlled substance, for example, in Marin County, the bail is 10,000. You'd think it'd be more expensive in Marin. In Alameda County, it's 20,000. In Santa Clara County, it's 25,000. And in San Francisco, it's 35,000. An another crime here, assault with a deadly weapon, 10,000 in Santa Clara County, 25,000 in Orange County, 30,000 in Alameda County, and a whopping $75,000 in San Francisco. Now, Corinne, let me ask you, do you, does the bail industry like having these high bails so you, you make more money? Uh, no, we, we do not. Uh, w with higher bail amounts comes higher risk to the bail bond agency and higher liability for the bail bond agency. Uh, no, we don't, that's not our consideration. Uh, when dealing with our clients, there, there are absorbently high bail amounts. And so that really prompts us to just work harder to make sure that the person, we can you know, arrange a, a policy or payment plan that is affordable to the family and to the defendant so that we can uh, secure their release from jail. So it, it's, it's not, um, we, we do, we understand that people cannot afford these bail amounts and, and we work hard to accommodate to make sure that they are able to be released from jail. Right, because if a person doesn't show up, you gotta find them or you're, you've gotta pay we the We do find the whole, them, we yeah. do find them, and we, we do make sure that they go to court. And we have, a, like I said, we're, we're very proud of our track record. Now, when it comes to the justice system, uh, everything uh, depends on that person going to court, or justice cannot be served if that person does not make their appearance in court before the judge. And like I said before, bail is the only form of pretrial release that can make that guarantee and we deliver every but single time. But, that, but that's it's, not true. It's we very have true. A actually, there, the, uh, there are systems in place. I mean, right now, what a lot of uh, uh, counties are doing, a lot of jurisdictions around the country, they, and, it's, and it started about 40 years ago in recognition of the problems of the bail system that has been, that have, you know, we have over 100 years history of problems with the bail system in this country. And so in the 1960s, beginning with the Manhattan Bail Project, um, we developed a, a systems of pretrial release where you actually had somebody go into the jail, you look at everybody who comes in, and you evaluate them based upon their risk factors, not about their ability to pay, but on their risk factors. And you divide them into categories. And we have one, well, well-functioning pretrial services right here in San Francisco that, we, that uh, was pioneered by Sheriff Michael Hennessy. It's a, it was a model for the country. And it divides people into risk categories. Uh, risk categories being high risk, the ones who will probably stay in jail and probably who need to stay in jail. Then the low, lower risk categories that you probably could be released on, on, uh, on, recogn on recognizance. Or the medium risk, who could be released with some level of, of supervision. And those actually work and actually have better, better return rates than the bail system. And those have been studied very extensively. The, the pretrial services here in San Francisco have, have over a 90% return rate. Your, your system is 82% no, as the not. Justice Department. We can get into studies. Your, your industry publishes these studies and they pay for them. No, the Department of Justice? We did not pay for a study done by the Department of Justice. You guys have released a study. You're a member of ALEC, right? the American Legislative Exchange Commission, which is the very conservative uh, uh, you're, you're, you're talking special about, interest group. Yeah, you're talking yeah. about the group that, that lobbies. Yeah. And no, I'm not a member. Let me ask you, ask you this. Your organization is. How? I don't, my organization's not. No. Yeah, how do, you, how do you overcome, though, the fact that we have nationally, except in four states, uh, a bail bond system, and, and they have a very powerful lobby. Uh, you know, how, how is it overcome? Do you, do you have any ideas on, well, on that, Sonia? Um, I think that, that what I can say is that the initial purpose of bail was to prevent failures to appear in court, okay? Right. Statutes now say, and they have said, I think in California since the 80s, or I'm not sure what year it was, but uh, the, what got added to the statute is that bail should be set also with the consideration of public safety, right. okay? So once you bring public safety into the picture, you're talking about a different thing. So bail was originally intended uh, to prevent people from failing to appear. 
it's pretty good at that, right? Yeah. But now we're asking Bale uh, to take on this other area, which is uh, protecting public safety. And I think that that's where the discrepancy arises. I mean, one thing we have now is we have technology, and, and here we have an ankle bracelet. And these now are used commonly uh, to make sure that the person is where they are. And it's amazing technology that they can see where you are at any given time. Uh, it goes off if you're, if you're in a neighborhood that you're not supposed to be in. Um, can technology take the place of bail? Uh, we actually use those. A lot of agencies uh, use uh, electronic monitoring on some of the defendants that they have that they would consider to be a little bit of a higher risk. The answer is you need an array of options at the pretrial stage to provide services to people who can be released. You have a lot of people, for example, who are in jail who could be released. They may have a substance abuse issue if you could get them, if you could provide substance abuse services, uh, if you could provide uh, intensive supervision. Uh, some people some people are taking up jail space because they have mental illness so we have to provide some specialized intervention for that population that's not addressed by the by the by the bail industry um, but in order to in order to create a, an equitable fair system we need a, a array of pretrial services that evaluates people based upon their risk based upon their needs places them into categories and then provides the necessary uh, interventions and for most of them you won't need interventions they'll return to court for those that we do we provide a level of supervision and it works I mean we've got examples of it right here in San Francisco where, so we, where we have an array of services you can't guarantee the bail guarantee. industry can't guarantee <laughs> we anything do guarantee. there is no guarantee in the criminal justice system and you by the way we do deliver like, you say like dog you're bounty hunter, you say right? you're deliver. A by the way you say you're an insurance you're I am not an insur insurance yes I am insurance when you, for example, if I go to buy car I'm insurance, an insurance can agent. I, let me finish. So if I go, if I go and if I go and buy car insurance, no boxing gloves now. If I go and buy <laughs> car insurance, insurance I'm going to be, insurance I'm going to be, agent. I'm going to evaluate it based on my risk. If I have a lot of accidents, then my insurance is going to go through the roof. Oh, if I go to you, it's just based we don't on want your any, We don't want to have any accidents here. I want to ask one question uh, about about race. I'm going to ask Sonia about this. Now, in San Francisco, African Americans are only six percent of the population. But if you look at those in custody, it's 56 percent African American. Do you think that uh, high bails in the bail system uh, has an impact on who's in jail? I think that it does have an impact on who's in jail. Uh, the question of race is, is it's prevalent in the criminal justice system. So um, we know that uh, people of color, African Americans, Latinos are overrepresented in the criminal justice system. Okay. Um, what we want to do in, in terms of pretrial is that if we're going to do a risk assessment on defendants, what we want to do is do a risk assessment that doesn't have some kind of bias sort of built into it. So uh, when you set up a risk assessment tool, what you want to do is test that risk assessment tool, make sure that it's effective uh, for all races and ethnicities, genders, age groups, so that you don't... Um, sort of unevenly assign a risk level to people just because of their race or ethnicity. Now this is similar to what uh, New Jersey did. They, they pushed this reform law and they're saying that it's going to result in, in, in more people getting out. Now, uh, Corinne, what you're saying is that uh, certainly for the people that can afford bail, you're able to get them to court 97% of the time. Yes. What about the people who will never be able to afford bail, someone who can't even put up $500 or $1,000 and wouldn't be able to put up 10% with your agency anyway. Well, the great thing about um, bail is that we, we will work with people on uh, down payment. And, and what bail does that, that pretrial services doesn't do is we incorporate their family and their friends. So when I'm writing and underwriting a, a policy on someone, I'm meeting their husband, their wife, their, their mother, their father, sister, brother, so in some cases their boss or their coworkers who are um, also signing to be held accountable that this person makes all of their court appearances. And if in the event that you know they forget to go to court or they don't go to court, I have other people within their circle of community that I can contact that will reach out to them and say, hey, you forgot to go to court. Can you make sure that you get back in there tomorrow and go to court? 
So we, I, we really do um, sort of get ourselves intertwined into everyone's, uh, their, our, our clients' lives and families, and we get to know these people on an intimate level. Pretrial services do, does case management. They do. They can do interventions. They can do group therapy. They do all. They whole, have a whole range of services in this in this city. I mean, I mean, if you look at the services that are provided by uh, an or organization like pretrial services or other organizations in the city, it will go far beyond what the average bail uh, agency provides. So if you someone provide chooses, supervision if and someone, you provide, you, if somebody comes into you and can chooses, make bail and can put the money down on the table, you'll serve them. And I get that. I understand that. But you can't tell me that you, that you sit here and you go out and you intervene with people based upon an array of needs that, you know, when the pe people in the criminal justice system sometimes have extensive needs. We have a lot of homeless people taking up space in our jail here. You're not serving them because they're, they're, they're high risk. They could be served, but we need specialized services for them. Bail is part of a, a, right. of a continuum, but it's not the only thing. And, and, it, and it doesn't serve the vast array of people who are sitting in jail right now who could be out but can't be out because they can't make the bail. Okay, so it, can I just ask one, I just want to make one, one point on that. So if someone chooses, is out on pretrial service, and they choose not to go to court because they don't want to, can you go get in your car, go drive to their house, and pick them up? Absolutely. In fact, by any means, sometimes bring we have them to back the in. Public defenders. No, <laughs> public defenders, or or no, or you no or you repeat, or you repeat, or you repeat. There are no laws that allow you to do that. But, that, but, to but, do but, that. but Cohen raises a good point, and let me ask you this: When you're talking about reform and changing these laws to let more people out, how do we ensure the public uh, right. that they're going to be safe? How do we make sure uh, that people aren't just being released and are going to be committing new crimes? Okay. Well. Well, here's the issue at hand. Our jails are currently overcrowded, okay? Bail, pretrial, whatever's going on in the counties across the state, we have a jail overcrowding problem. So there are a number of people who walk out of jail every day. They don't pay bail. They're, they're released because there's no capacity in the jail. And they're released without bail and without pretrial services. So I certainly think that the state of California can do better than that. Uh, and that is certainly... Uh, releasing people in that way on an emergency basis based on capacity is almost definitely not the best way to protect public safety. Well, we, we know that now there are thousands of people, there have been thousands of people uh, released uh, every year by the Department of Corrections because of a lawsuit uh, right. that was yes. filed. Right. And it's interesting because people would have expected crime rates to go up, but they're down. That's right. And the, the, the question would be, uh, you know, for all of you is, if we change the bail system and we make it so people can get out uh, without posting bail, uh, is, is, is that going to equalize our justice system? Is that going to make it so uh, people are treated fairly? The, the, I think the answer to that is depends on the county. Um, because every county is different. Uh, for, let me say, one county, Santa Cruz, Santa Cruz, a couple years ago, they were having a problem with this problem with overcrowding. And, and what often happens in a lot of counties is the sheriff who's elected and the chief probation officer who's under the judicial branch don't always cooperate. There's not a, there's not a natural, sometimes there's just not a, a, a synergy. But what happened here is the sheriff in Santa Cruz County, the chief probation officer got together. The sheriff said, you know, I got a lot of people in my jail who are homeless, who have, you know, have a lot of issues, who could be released. They don't need to be in jail, but I don't know how to release them. And the bail industry is not gonna, wasn't addressing it. So they, went to the, to the, so they went to the chief probation officer. They came up with a pretrial services concept using probation officers, using the sheriffs to identify who was in the jail, who could be released, who could be released with services, who could be released with intensive supervision. They cut the population in the jail by 20%. They were, they were, at the time, they were talking about expanding the jail. Now, all that talk went away. Now they're talking about ex further expanding the array of community-based services. And they had over a 90% return rate. And it was a, it was, it, it's an excellent program. And everyone agrees that that was the way that they needed to go. And, you know, the concern that we have as, as public defenders is that a lot of people plead guilty because they're in jail, because they want to get out. And the judges know this, and they'll keep them in jail, and then... Uh, when they're offered credit for time served or some sentence where they can get out, they'll get out. But 
This uh, <laughs> debate uh, is one that's going to be ongoing. Thanks for watching Justice Matters. I want to thank our guests, Corin Rankin, Dan McAleer, sure. and Sonia Tafoya for being here. Please email us with any comments at justicematterssf at gmail.com or follow us on Twitter at SF Defender. See you next time on Justice Matters.